move to the first uh, talk uh, in, the, in the day's program. It's a great pleasure to introduce my friend, colleague, and mentor, and good buddy, Paul Stamets, who, as everyone here knows who he is, another pioneer in the field of mycology, and uh, he's going to talk. He's the president of Michael Medica Life Sciences, which is a new company he's formed, as well as Fungi Perfecti, the business he's had for many years that makes uh, wonderful or herbal, or rather fungal, <laughs> extracts and products, you know, to support the immune system. He's written many books, and I don't really have to give him an introduction. He is a force of nature in his own right, and uh, we're so pleased that he could make time. He's not, a, not sitting around wondering what to do. He's got a lot going on, so we really appreciate he made time to come spend with us here. He is... Uh, he lectures extensively to deepen the understanding and respect for the organisms that literally exist under every footstep taken on this path of life. His presentations cover a range of mushroom species and research, showing how mushrooms can help the health of people and planet. And I do want to mention this very well-received uh, documentary that he, that Paul was featured in with, uh, along with other people. I got a cameo appearance, but Paul was kind of the center of it called Fantastic Fungi. I don't imagine there's anybody in this room that hasn't seen it, but uh, if you haven't seen it, go back to your room tonight and <laughs> fire up Netflix and look at it because it's an incredible documentary made by uh, Louis Schwartzberg, another close friend of ours. So Paul today is going to speak about the stoned ape theory. The uh, title of his talk is Revisiting the McKenna Stoned Ape Theory, the Ever-Evolving Case of Its Plausibilities. So welcome, Paul. Thanks so much, yeah. brother. Do you need anything? Water? Uh, water would be great. Okay. So, gotcha. We'll make sure you yeah. get that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm so humbled to be around so many kindred spirits and greats. Um, so thank you deeply, Dennis, and the McKenna Academy, and to all of you. So I am going to take you through a, um, a short history of the psilocybin use and to emerge into what I think are new horizons of extraordinarily exciting research. So this is going to be from my perspective of my journey with psilocybin, but I'm one knowledge keeper in a continuum of knowledge keepers. And this is not one individual story, this is the story of all of us that we share as a community. So there are archaeological suggestions of the use of psychoactive mushrooms. The Mesoamerican mushroom stones in Maya, the Aztec culture was well documented in using uh, psilocybin mushrooms. In northern Algeria 7,000 years ago, there's an interesting cave art with the association of mushrooms and bees. As many of you know, psilocybin mushrooms were preserved in honey as an ancient tradition. Even persists today in, in Mesoamerica and Mexico. Um, and then when there's a codolith here, a relief from 400 BCE, where Demeter is giving Persephone a mushroom before she enters into the underworld in the fall, which was in Greek mythology, the advent of the seasons, and for her to reemerge uh, in the spring. So because we only know of the history of psilocybin mushrooms in Paleolithic times or in ancient times only through the artists who've rendered these works. So that's an important role that artists play, I think, in being able to understand some of the psilocybin history. It's so important to give tribute to indigenous peoples, especially to Maria Sabina, who in 1957 opened up 
her doors for R. Gordon and Valentina Wasson. And this led to a rediscovery, in a sense, of the use of psilocybin mushrooms. But this Valentina Wasson was the mycologist. This is really important for people to understand. Tina Wasson and, and R. Gordon Wasson on a honeymoon in the Adirondacks in upstate New York. Walking down the trail, they encountered a beautiful fruiting of mushrooms. And Tina was so excited, she ran to the mushrooms and with glee and excitement, and Gordon was horrified. <laughs> and they just had, had become married. And it's from that dialectic that began a lifelong um, ethnomycological study on mycophobia versus mycophilia, terms that they coined at the time. Unfortunately, Tina Wasson uh, died in 1958. A Russian heritage, she grew up in a culture that was extremely mycophilic, and then Gordon, had, with his English background and roots, grew up in a society that was mycophobic. Um, and in that region of Oaxaca, they were using a species called uh, Psilocybe zapatacorum, and she's a Mazatec shaman. This led to the publication of a monograph called Les Champagnons Hallucinogens du Mexique, uh, in which was ascribed many uh, new species uh, to science, not new to the indigenous people, of course. Um, so this was, this was a pivotal moment when in 1957, or uh, 19, yeah, 1957, May 23rd, um, millions of copies of Life magazine arrived in the doorsteps and the mailboxes of Americans with a complete feeble guide to psilocybin mushrooms and in, in wondrous descriptions of uh, uh, Gordon Wasson's experience with Maria Savina. So let's see. I want to give tribute to my father and my mother and my brother John. These individuals were hugely influential in my life. I, I grew up in a, in a large house in a scientific family. We had a complete laboratory in the basement. And this laboratory is about the size of this room and had three, four rows of shelves full of chemicals, had microscopes. My brother John, much older than myself, he was a serious scientist, he was the chemist. I was the youngest one in my family. I adored my oldest brother and I wanted to hang with them all the time. But I was kind of a nuisance in the laboratory. But my father served on the aircraft carrier, the Intrepid, during World War II. And he got the Intrepid aircraft carrier radio, the main radio from the, from the aircraft carrier, and we had it in our basement. So my brother John would sit me in a chair, and I could play and listen to coded messages behind the Iron Curtain. I st strung about a 200-foot long uh, wire, copper wire with glass insulators to be able to get long wave uh, radio signals. And I would listen to coded messages, you know, that were really ins interesting to me as my brother John did his, his experiments. He went on, went on to Yale. Uh, my older brother Bill went on to Cornell. And my twin brother and I were left with a laboratory in the basement. And I remember eagerly looking up any experiment that said, danger, do not bring near a flame. <laughs> 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 One time we had a massive explosion in the laboratory. My mother could run running down. I said it was okay. Um, I still remember that formula, but because of bio uh, terrorism, I'm not going <laughs> to re recite the formula right here. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, John uh, was my tripping buddy. We journeyed together a lot. And um, my father asked me for psilocybin mushrooms, and I turned him down. I turned him down... Um, and I also turned um, down, this is my brother John. Um, he came back from Yale with his book, Alder States of Consciousness. Um, I was so excited about the work that he was doing. He went to Mexico, he went to Colombia, came back with these incredible stories of tripping on psilocybin mushrooms. And so when he came from Yale and he was doing a, a course on Alder States of Consciousness, this is a book by Charles Tart. University of California, Davis, you know, I just gobbled up this book. It was so important to me. In this book, um, I had it, and I, uh, my best friend, Ryan, who I was hanging with all the time, he saw my interest in this book, and he borrowed it. And I said, okay, you can borrow it, but you have to give it back in about a week. My, my brother's going back to Yale. And so, you know, several days passed, and, and I get very close to my brother's returning, and I kept on bugging Ryan for the book. 
I said, please, give me back my brother John's book. John is asking me for it. And he was pressuring me. And then so finally, I just got really upset. Ryan, I need the book back now. He's leaving tomorrow. And Ryan said, I can't give it back to you. My father found it and burned it. I said, your father burned my brother's book? And thereupon, I realized, wow, if this resulted in this authoritarian figure reacting in such a way, then I definitely want to focus on this subject. <laughs> so here's John with philosophy, Samuel Ansieta, Liberty Cap. And then I went on and I immersed myself in the field of mycology and study. I spent an enormous amount of time at the University of Washington Science Library in the basement. And most of the journals had any pages on psilocybin mushrooms were razored out because the interest was so great. Um, and so I went on and at the Evergreen State College and I published my first book in 1978. That's almost 40 years ago. Um, here I pre presented it to my mother, who graciously you know, loved her son dearly and accepted my, <laughs> my peculiar interest in the subject that she was a little bit you know, nervous about. My brother John, of course, you can just see the look of pride on his face that his younger brother came out with a book on psilocybin mushrooms. So this is how long I've been focused on this subject. There's a book that greatly influenced me, and I don't remember the author. It was called The Crack in the Cosmic Egg. Some of you may have known that book. It's when, like Dennis and, and Merlin and Juliana and many other people here, you immerse yourself into a subject, and Manolo as well. There are things that come to you just intuitively, empathically. It's no longer your cognitive reductionist thinking. It's a sudden eureka moments of just intuitive realization which you then begin to understand, these are not the origins of your own thinking. These are the origins of the milieu in which you've immersed your, your, your focus. And it's like nature is giving you this wisdom. This, this talk uh, towards this end is very much representative of that. So Alexander Smith was one of my mentors. He also asked me for psilocybin mushrooms like my father, and I turned him down as well. I turned both of them down, even though they were hugely important people in my life, because I asked them both. I asked my father, I asked Alexander Smith, who wrote a monograph on the genus philosophy, also in 1958. And I asked, if I do these psilocybin mushrooms with you, will your wives, I asked both of them, will you also join us in this trip? And they both said, no, absolutely not. And I said, I don't want to be responsible for you having a life-changing decision at the end of your experience, at the end of your life, that is going to be very difficult for you to explain. It could shake the very foundations of your religious beliefs. It could change your whole view of reality. I don't want that responsibility of creating a divide in your relationship. So I said, if, if both of you would take the mushrooms with me together, then I will do it. And since they both declined, I declined. And then it became really focused on in my life's philosophy that I have a responsibility. This is why I came up with the phrase long ago, nature provides, I don't. Because when you give psilocybin or a sacrament or a psychostropic substance to somebody else, you own part of that experience. You have a responsibility for the therapy that and you need to be a good therapist or psychiatrist or a psychi a psychiatrist to be able to help people assimilate and process this experience. To, use, to give someone so, such a powerful substance and then to walk away from it, I think is irresponsible. So um, Daniel Stuntz, University of Washington, species named after him, Psilocybe Stuntzii, Kit Skates, which is a huge influence in my life, and then Dr. Michael Bugh at the Evergreen State College. And Michael and myself, and then Jeremy Bigwood, received a Drug Enforcement Administration license, and then in 1977, 78, and thereupon I could collect and cultivate lots of psilocybin mushrooms. <laughs> and I did. But about every third person that came up to me I thought was an undercover DEA agent. <laughs> um, so I, I was you know, very, very focused. And this is really important that people understand. We live in this sort of really um, 
liberal state of acceptance of psychedelics right now. And especially mushrooms, the psilocybin mushrooms have become the zeitgeist of our times. But back then, it was a high state of paranoia. You know, it was a time of, of anti-war pro protests, the time subsequent to Nixon um, weaponizing the drugs and creating the war on drugs, which was a politically and racist mo motivated um, of exercise and being able to put in the same bucket uh, African Americans, uh, environmental environmentalists, the anti-war protesters. You know, it was a very convenient excuse to use the war and drugs to suppress his political opponents. So I went on to publish four species, uh, Psilocybe azurescens, one of the most potent species in the world, if not the most potent species in the world, uh, over two, two and a half, sometimes 3% psilocybin and psilocin. Uh, Psilocybe sinor fibrillosa, Psilocybe liniformis variety americana, an extremely rare species, and Psilocybe wileyi, which is very closely related to Psilocybe serialescens. Then we started conducting a series of psilocybin mushroom conferences. And this is uh, one of the first ones we did in 1979. Uh, I'm in the center there. Uh, Stephen Pollock on the, far, on, on the far left, Jim Jacobs, Dale Leslie, Dr. Gaston Guzman, who wrote a monograph on the genus Psilocybe in Mexico, Jeremy Bigwood, and Jonathan Ott. This conference here, ESP D55, is a continuum of these gatherings where knowledge keepers are coming to pass on knowledge to the next generation and to celebrate the extraordinary experiences that collectively we have shared. Then further on these conferences, we I conducted these conferences for 20 years. Um, 1998 was a renowned conference in Amsterdam. And there's Albert Hofmann, the Sasha Shulgin, uh, myself, the Donna and, and Manolo, <laughs> who are here in the audience. Um, but this also represents a continuation. And then I realized, because I'm a deadhead, and I love the Grateful Dead, then I, kn I knew Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters. But I also knew you know, Sasha Shulgin and Andy Weil and all these other scientists and medical doctors. So I realized I was in the Venn intersection of these two camps. So I decided, OK, let's do the Millennium Mushroom Conference, and let's bring the Merry Pranksters and Ken Kesey and the bus further with the psychedelic scientists at Brighton Bush Hot Springs. So we did. We had 40 speakers. Uh, we had about 120 people. It was the, the most wonderful loss, no, investment I've ever made. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, it just nearly bankrupted me. Um, and then it was on Halloween night, and this will be coming out on Netflix. Um, we had a, this incredible party, costume party. And every person was announced, you know, prior to their entrance, wearing their garb, disguised as animals and, you know, magicians. I think Sasha Shulgin came in as, as Merlin, the, the, the magician. Um, and then we had the witch's brew. And we had 10 species of psilocybin mushrooms in that brew, Slossy, <laughs> Slossy, uh, because all these psychonauts came together and so said they brought in psilocybin mushrooms. So we had Slossy cubensis, cyanescens, uh, azurescens, you know, semilanceata, baeocystis, et cetera, et cetera. So pretty soon doing this costume ball and this band, I've never heard a better band <laughs> in my life. <laughs> and pretty soon 140 people were tripping at this, this party and I said, oh my gosh, you know, I have all this work that I've done, you know, the DEA is obviously, you know, interested in my work, and I, so I announced this is the last conference I'll ever organize, right? Because I lost control of the conference. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but there, there is Michael Bug, there's Andy Weil, is a major force in the 1970s and 80s and continues to be so. And the, and the benefits of psychedelics, see, this needs to be mentioned, Gary Link Linkoff, who recently passed away. So we went, I went on to publish uh, seven books now. And, um, and this is Terrence McKenna, my daughter, Ladina, Ladina Bear, as I know her. Um, and this is at a, at, also at Brighton Bush. And Dennis and uh, Terrence, uh, along with Jeremy Bigwood and Kat Harrison, 
uh, published the Psilocybin Magic Mushroom Scrover's Guide under the pseudonyms uh, Austin and Eric. This book, even though my, my books are great, I love my books, but this Psilocybin Mush uh, Magic Mushroom Scrover's Guide was the book that had the greatest influence in the, showing people how to grow psilocybin mushrooms um, on a small scale. And so I mention it as, like I mentioned, as a psilocybin mushroom scholarship fund, and where people in colleges throughout Europe and the United States would be growing small amounts of psilocybin cubensis in their closets, in their dorm rooms, et cetera. Um, so T Terrence um, and Dennis, um, prior to this time, about a decade before, proposed the stoned ape theory. Now, I, I suggest to you as the stoned ape hypothesis. A hypothesis is an idea that is not currently substantiated by fact. A theory is an idea substantiated by fact, but not necessarily a proven theory. You know, it could be a hypothetical theory. Um, so um, this book and Terence and Dennis's work um, and mine and that of others, a Andrew Weil, Sasha Shulgin, Ken Keyes was a huge influencer because of the electric acid Kool-Aid test, you know, um, sometimes a great notion. Um, many of, the, of his books and some of the books were made into screenplays, et cetera. He was a, he was a, a mecca where people would go to, to, to have him identify mushrooms. And, and Ken told me, he says, Paul, I don't know shit about mushrooms, you know. People bring them to me all the time. I know Liberty Caps. Um, so, so Ken Kesey relied upon me for species identification, which is one of the reasons why we developed a nice bond. So let's look at the, the stone date hypothesis. And it basically, you know, there was a sudden enlargement of the human, uh, of the hominid brain about two million years ago that expanded substantially two to three times. Um, and Homo sapiens, us, were a recent evolutionary species. We're only about 200,000 years old. Now that's quite remarkable. And what the rapid increase in brain size occurred at the time of, of substantial climate change. And so that's interesting. As climates change, there's a force um, uh, 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 on the environment, on the survival of a species, then the skill sets of that species are absolutely necessary for the species to survive. So this, you know, what explains this? Well, there is no explanation. But Terence and Dennis proposed the stone ape hypothesis. I give credit here to Louis Schwartzberg for this animation. As our hominid ancestors descended from the trees, they were following ungulates, uh, animals. They would encounter mushrooms in the dung. And if you're tracking animals, you're looking for footprints, you're looking for dung. You take these mushrooms, you're hungry. Mushrooms also are infected with <laughs> You have this massive awakening, <laughs> and it would stimulate. They thought, they thought that brain neurons would grow. Now, this was roundly dispelled uh, uh, by scientific critics as being ridiculous, some stoner's dream. So, um, as much as roundly. Uh, disregarded by quote-unquote serious scientists, of course, stoners celebrated this concept <laughs> and thought, yeah, of course. So uh, is this idea so preposterous? Now, let's, let's just look at the, just the general math on this. For millions of years, our ancestors would be in the forest, tracking animals, looking for scat, dung, finding these mushrooms, hungry, mushrooms breed larvae, most primates are, you know, eat larvae as a protein and food source. So th this would happen not once, not twice, but millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of times. So in terms of epigenesis, the influence of a stimulus on an organism, genes that would code in response would be re-stimulated over and over again. So that's, that's very interesting. So psilocybe cubensis is incredibly obvious. This is not something like psilocybe zapatocorum is hidden in the landscape. Those of you who collect at Golden Tops, you can see these from 200 feet away. They're, they're, they're 
absolutely bodaciously obvious. And so you would encounter these. You're hungry. You're tracking animals. So the repetitive encountering of Slosby Kibensis, and you would then feed your family, who was also hungry. You would share in this experience. So this hypothesis is an example of one we may not be able to prove in the past, but I want to present to you, I think we can prove it now and going into the future. It's very easily grown, as most of you know, on grains. This is on, on an elephant dung here, and you can grow it in jars, you can grow it um, in trays. And I want to bring your attention to the fact there are 22 primates, 23 when you count humans, we're primates, who have a documented use of mushrooms. Consider that, 23 primates. Now that speaks to a large sort of genetic uh, foundation of the interaction of primates with mushrooms. They saw them as an essential foodstuffs. One here, the Golgi monkey of Bolivia and the Amazonian is 12 times its body weight per year. So this is just not an incidental interaction with fungi. Fungi were a mainstay of the foodstuffs of many primates of many species. So Slosby Kivensis is uh, easily grown. Um, this is a technique that I developed. I don't think you can get more mushrooms <laughs> in that tray. Um, and so now Slosby Kivensis is the mushroom that's most commonly used throughout the world and the subject of many of the studies um, that we're engaged in. So I want to talk to you just briefly about the importance of the morphology of, this, of the mushroom. <clears throat> when they're very young like this, the gills are immature, the cap, the cap flesh is very thick. But literally what happens is in a matter of a few hours, the caps expand, the cap flesh becomes thin, the lamellae, the gills, become large, and they produce spores. The spores have no psilocybin. So there's a biotransformation of these substantial amounts of psilocybin present in the flesh to very, to almost negligible, to no psilocybin whatsoever in the spores. This happens in a matter of a few hours. 100% of asthmatic children in one study are allergic to Slosby cubensis stores, as, uh, spores. Uh, asthmatic children become asthmatic adults. So think of this. Adverse reactions are really important in terms of public safety. It's really critical that mushrooms are harvested at a young stage and the partial veils are intact. Because you can go from this one stage here on the left, the fully expanded caps on the far right, in a matter of four to five hours. So that's really important that people understand. You should only be consuming closed cap, veils intact, dried Slosby cubensis. People who try to think bigger is better is not true. Even though the mushrooms appear larger, the density decreases. And so morphologically, you may have the appearance of the mushroom being larger, but in fact, the masses remain the same. There's a reapportionment of the flesh going into thinner, less dense gill tissue, et cetera. <clears throat> so another example of the prime stage of collecting these. So let's look at some of the data that's been published recently in the past 10 years. Here's a survey of, of prisoners, inmates, 480,000 people surveyed. And when they did a, a, this meta survey and then the questionnaire they asked about their, their use of drugs, very interestingly, psilocybin use was associated with a 27% decrease odds of larceny or theft, 22% decrease odds of property crime, 18% decrease odds for a violent crime. Well, now, critics will say association is not causation, but it can be, and it can be a blend of both. So psilocybin use is associated with a reduction of criminal activity. Psilocybin use also is associated with a reduction of intimate partner-to-partner -partner violence. No, they're psychedelic in the study, but psilocybin was. <laughs> So I always thought if you came out with a dating app <laughs> and you're looking at your, your prospects, the really important question, have you tripped on psilocybin before? Yes, you advance for it, right? <laughs> you haven't tripped, whoop, okay, I don't know about you. <laughs> Reduce my chances here. 
So psilocybin use is associated with the reduction, again, of violence. So there are many clinical studies ongoing right now. I think the number now is 89. You go to clinicaltrials.gov, and there's 89 studies on psilocybin for therapeutic benefit. And not a single published study to date covers psilocybin mushroom use. It's all on the molecule. So there's a massive disconnect. I think it's no exaggeration to say the following. 99.99999% of the use of psilocybin is in the form of psilocybin mushrooms. And yet there are no studies just recently, one or two, it's going to skirt the issue, and there's some new studies being proposed, but that vast disparity of real-world use versus the reductionist thinking of using just the molecule in order to get FDA approval, to be able to go past the IRB boards, to be able to see cause and effect of a single molecule. This is the disparity we see in science and the difference between a natural product you know, point of view versus a molecular point of view. So there is a more recent study just came out April 7th, and psilocybin was the only psychedelic associated with lower odds, uh, odds of o opioid use disorder. Opioid use disorder is a huge problem across the world. It has affected my family. Opioid use disorder is most often associated with people self-medicating themselves to overcome shame, to overcome guilt, to overcome pain and hurt, PTSD, emotional trauma, tragedy. And then opioid use users are vilified by society, so they're further shamed. So what do they do? They use more opioids. When you have a family member like me and my family, it affects not just the user. It affects the family. It affects your friends, your neighbors, your neighborhood, your village, your city, your state, your province, your country, the world. The expense to society is tremendous. The court system, law enforcement, you know, treatment, it's an extraordinary tug on the evolution of our cultural advancement. But psilocybin is different. Psilocybin reduces crime. Psilocybin reduces violence. Psilocybin makes nicer people, like a pebble in the pond. You resolve this trauma. You kick opioids. You become a nicer person. You become a better partner. You're more empathetic. You're a force of good trying to down-regulate anger of other people. Try to reach out a hand of friendship and understanding like a pebble in a pond. There's emanations of goodness to you, to your family, to your neighbors, to your village, to your city, to your province, to your state, to your country, to the world. The differential between the negative and the positive is extraordinary. The amount of resources can be saved in governments the expense of society, think of it. Psilocybin and psilocybin mushrooms are here today at a time critical that they can have an enormous impact beneficially in helping us resolve many of the issues that we face today. So I want to jump into some of the research we've been doing. And I came up with a stack, and it's called, well known as the Stamet Stack, I'll leave this up so you can take photographs of it. I have adjusted the amount of niacin because I was trying to induce a flush of niacin. Nicotinic acid is niacin, not nicotinamides. That's, that's different. 
This is the flushing form of niacin, a form of vitamin B3. And I came up with a stock um, influenced by Terence and Dennis's snow nape hypothesis. And I stocked it with niacin because ni psilocybin is a vasoconstrictor. Niacin is a vasodilator. So I thought, wow, greater dilation, more delivery of psilocybin. Well, niacin also um, is excites the nerve endings. So those of you who've taken a high dose of niacin, 15 minutes or so, you start itching, you get beet red, you know, your clothes feel like wool, you want to take off your clothes. And I thought, wow, neuropathies oftentimes present themselves as a deadening of the toes and the fingertips from vasoconstriction and dying back of nerves. With vasodilation and the excitation of the nerve endings, niacin would help deliver the psilocybin neurogenic benefits. And then lion's mane mushrooms, which I mentioned yesterday, one of the best studied medicinal mushrooms in the world, I think five clinical studies currently, again, at mushroomreferences.com, you know, please go to that website, you can look up the references, um, and it regenerates myelin on the axons of nerves. So I thought by stacking these three together, it has many advantages, those which I just mentioned, but also niacin as an adversant, like antabuse is to alcoholics. If you can do microdosing, and you put 25 to 50 milligrams of niacin, if someone tries to do 10 times that much, the adverse reaction that they would get by association would be very uncomfortable. So the idea was, well, how can we make the FDA, or how can we make agencies, how can we allow this to have access for the masses? By stacking it with niacin as an adversant, I think that's one step. Of course, there's other, you, could, you could use low doses uh, of Ipecac, et cetera. You could stack that with niacin as well. But the idea of niacin gives a multiplicity of benefits. So this is, was my hypothesis. Okay? This stack could allow microdosing. And I know personally from experience, of not so far in the distant past, that niacin really enhances the psilocybin experience. So there are two protocols for microdosing. One's the Fatiman protocol, and one's the protocol that I came up with. My protocol is one to four days, and then two to three days off. Jim Fatiman's protocol is dose on one day, two, do two days, no dosing, fourth day, dose, and then repeat. Jim and I are good friends. I said, Jim, how do you come up with your protocol? And he goes, I don't know, I just made it up. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I just made mine up too. But I do a lot of tissue culture. I run a lot of cells. I have over 700 fungal strains, you know, that we're running mycelium constantly. We understand senescence. We understand the importance of keeping cell lines young. Uh, they're vigorously growing. Uh, many of you may not know, if you overculture mycelium, the analogy I can make is that when it's young, it's like the netting of a nylon sock. And then if you overpropagate it, it becomes like that of a tennis net. It loses the interconnections, the density of cells. So if you titrate like a 30 milligram dose of psilocybin, which is a high dose used therapeutically oftentimes, you titrate it into 30 days at one milligram per day, you're giving those cells that are dividing a constant exposure to a neurogenic agent, as opposed to dosing it all at once, and then the half-life of psilocybin is two and a half hours. So in one day, you have one five hundredth and twelfth, by the math, uh, of the psilocybin you had on day one. So it disappears from your system. So I thought, well, why not titrate that over time? So the growth of neurons, the growth of mycelium, I think is a very good uh, allegory. So we, and the, the we, I mean, uh, Quantified Citizen, Dr. Pam Crisco and myself, uh, Ismail um, and Kaylin, the two founders of Quantified Citizen, we came together and with others and we co-designed an app, which you can download now for droids and, and iOS, Apple devices, um, at microdose.me. And the app was designed to study microdosing behavior. So. It's fully vetted, um, it's approved you know, uh, by health authorities, it's anonymized data, so you own your own data. And we set up this app and we wanted to see what the characteristics were of the users that were engaged. 
And so you go to the app, you put it in your password, you microdose today, what you microdose with? Lion's mane, you know, psilocybin mushrooms, LSD, how much did you take? Um, and whether, you know, characteristics of the formula that you were taking, and then there's challenge tests, cognitive tests, memory tests, hearing tests, visual acuity tests, et cetera. And then you can then rate your progress uh, over time. So um, we announced this, and I was on the Joe Rogan podcast, and I announced it, and that got a lot of people involved. Um, and so we ended up having more than 8,000 people participate. Now, the extraordinary thing is that we had more non-microdosers than microdosers. That totally blew us away. 4,200 or 300 non-microdosers, 4,100 or so microdosers. So the very weighted population. This impressed uh, the peer reviewers at Nature. So we published this November 18th, 2021, the third most downloaded article in Nature uh, scientific uh, reports in 2021. And it's because the data set is so large. And so our statisticians that were involved were, were extremely uh, skilled at this. And this is a very interesting uh, data set. It compares sex, sexual preferences, income, ethnicities. It's, it's millions of data points that we're still crunching the data on. So we... Um, in the app, there's basically three different metrics of dosages, less than uh, a tenth of a gram. And most of you know that one gram of Slosby cubensis is lift off, uh, lift off. That's around 10, millig 10 milligrams. So clinical studies that are doing psilocybin are using about equivalency of about three grams of Slosby cubensis, 30 milligrams, up to 40 milligrams, four grams. Hero's journey, five milligrams at 1% psilocybin variability, of course, in that. So the majority of participants are in the medium to low dose. 78% are in that, you know, less than 0.1 grams to less than a third of a gram. So that was interesting that we had a really good sampling of microdosers that were truly microdosing. About 39% of the people who were stacking were using the Stamet stack. 5%, for instance, were using chocolate. Lots of people well, obviously combine the two, but chocolate alone only represented 5% of the users. 39% or so of stackers were using the formula that I presented. So here is some of the preliminary data. This is for more than 8,000 participants. And with the stack, in terms of mood and mental health, um, and with psilocybin, substantial reduction in depression highly significant in terms of, of, uh, of the range. So in the, with mood, you can see the p-value is extraordinarily uh, uh, low, less than 0 0.001. Uh, for depression, it's more modest, less than 0 0.05. So this data was very positive, showing that microdosing reduced depression. The critics came out of the woodwork. Say, what about expectancy? The weirdest criticism is what about, this was not a placebo controlled study. No shit, Sherlock. <laughs> this is an observational study. You know, people know what they're doing. So, but because of the expectancy effect, you know, people expect that this will help them resolve depression. They heard about it, they read about it. So, okay, that's a valid, valid concern. So Dr. Pam Crisco and I started having discussions. She's a medical doctor and the head of the Canadian Psychedelic Association. And I'm going, you know, we went back and forth and, you know, pretty concerned about these, these criticisms. And I, I said, well, you know, don't we have a, a test that's beyond subjectivity? And she said, yes, we have a motor skill test. And I'm going, yeah, motor skill test, what one was that? She said, well, we have a tap test. So we then task our statisticians, let's look at something that's motor skill related. And the only motor skill test that we had, um, I believe, was the tap test. So that finger tapping test is how often you can tap your two fingers together in 10 seconds. When you're in your 20s, you can do it really fast. When you're in your 60s, you can't. So the idea with a tap test here is that you're alternating fingers, and it's a test that is used uh, specifically for Parkinson's, measuring Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, 
uh, dementia, traumatic brain injury. And unfortunately, there's a steady decline with Alzheimer's, dementia, and, and Parkinson's. And so you lose the ability of coordination. It's a psychomotor event that you lose the ability uh, to perform. So this is our results. We just received two days ago acceptance for publication. So the, the, a journal I'm not going to mention, but you can probably pretty much guess what it is. Um, and it went through peer review, and it's an exhaustive study. The first study was horizontal. This is more of a vertical. So we thought, well, the motor skills, they decline in age. So it's age-related. New news to everyone who's getting older, you have neurodegeneration in age. <laughs> so we looked at the data set of people 55 years and older, and we saw, they saw a signal. The signal was so strong that they, our co-authors, the statisticians, said, we found something, but we have a hard time believing it. So we're going to attack this data. They used three statistical analytical techniques. They could not break it. It survived. And the data here with the stackers, in 30 days, the performance of the finger te uh, test went from 48 to 68, with a very substantial p-value significance. The non-stackers were non-significant, and the people who were doing psilocybin only, importantly, were non-significant. It's just the people who are combining psilocybin mushrooms, lion's mane, and niacin. Substantial increase. This is not due to expectancy. There's no placebo explanation. I look forward to the skeptics when this is published, twisting themselves into pretzels, <laughs> trying, to, <laughs> trying to explain you know, why this data can't be real. It is real. We see a signal, a psychomotor event. So then, in our discussions, what's the mode of action? What's the mechanism of action? Now, I'm not a neurologist, but I've been, again, went down the wormhole of neurology and neurogeneration, and we came and we found there's actually some very good in vitro tests. So we started looking at the in vitro tests that we could do. To date, I have personally spent more than $1 million on the data that you're about to see. This has been a concerted effort with seven of my scientists and a great team of people with, under my leadership. And the results, I think, are extraordinarily interesting. We started looking at MAP kinases. These are actually proteins that bind with receptors on the nerves, and when they bind, they stimulate neurogeneration. Now, there's neurogenesis, newborn nerve cells. That's with track B, BDNF, brain-derived nerve factors. Track A's is nerve growth factors, neurogeneration. And JAK1 are neuroanti-inflammatories. And track C's also bind for NGFs in the central and peripheral uh, nervous system. And they cause also synaptogenesis, neuroplasticity. So the four terms of art here are neurogenesis, newborn nerve cells, neurogeneration, well, nerves growing, neuroregeneration, nerves begin to atrophy, and then they grow, they end up regrowing, and then neuroplasticity, which leads to synaptogenesis. Again, it's like the idea of the tennis net versus the nylon sock. So we looked at these receptor proteins in particular. And I bring, before I show you the results, I, any of you can go to clinicaltrials.gov, and you can put in psilocybin. You'll get 89 studies or so. Secondary search term, put in niacin. And you'll get 10 clinical trials using niacin opposite psilocybin as a positive control. Why? Because in 15 minutes, they feel something. In 15 minutes with psilocybin, you feel something. Now, so this is the standard double-blind, placebo-controlled study, you know, model. In speaking three days ago to a PI in one of these studies, he confessed to me, this is ridiculous that we use niacin. He goes, in 15 minutes, people feel hot, they're red, and they're itchy. It's not a blinded study. It becomes unblinded in 15 minutes. 
And yet, you have 10 institutions, not just 10 institutions, not just 10 authors, but I suggest to you probably more than 100 scientists you know, supported this model of using niacin opposite psilocybin. I'm suggesting using niacin with psilocybin. So, some of our synergy data. Psilocin stimulates a little track A, niacin does, the predicted additive sum is the blue and the red. You put them together, the stacking formulation has nearly a five time increase in the expression of these proteins that lead to neurogeneration. This is at 3.3 milligrams of psilocybin, or psilocin, and everyone knows that psilocybin is a prodrug for psilocin. Psilocybin is stable, that's why you ingest it, it becomes psilocin, so that's why we're using psilocin in cell contact. And then, under this time, it's up to 10 milligrams. You can see that it also has a high coefficient, 6.4. So we have synergism of the entourage effect. More neurogenic in this, in this test than the individual components. <clears throat> then we're looking at lion's mane mycelium. Aranacine C is the active constituent. This is very important, you know, it's from lion's mane mycelium, not the fruit bodies. We added psilocin and niacin, and we get something truly extraordinary. No activity of aranacine C, no activity of psilocin, no activity of niacin. You put those three together, you have zero plus zero plus zero equals zero. You put them three together, and we have a new term of art to me called the maximum calculable value. It refers to an instance in which a stack provides infinity where the individual components do not. And this is at one, one thousandth of a standardized therapeutic dose. 30 milligrams, 40 milligrams, to four, to, to 0.4, to 0.04. Neurogenic benefits at one thousandth of a therapeutic dose. Now, it's not just at this dilute amount. This is the diffusion gradient. So we're seeing signal at such a low amount that stimulates neurogenesis with the entourage effect of combining the elements inside the stack. <clears throat> Most exciting receptor protein, by far, to me, is track B. Track B differentiates, differentiates stem cells into nerve cells in the hippocampus, newborn neurons. So this is like the holy grail in, in uh, neurology, is that if you can stimulate new neurons to be born from stem cells, then you're well on the road of neurological benefit. Moreover, an article specifically published because not, um, track B stimulates BDNF, brain-derived nerve factors, and it stimulates neurotropic fa factor that's useful in depression, physical activity, such as a TAP test, and neuroplasticity. Again, maximum calculable value. You have experts teaching away from this invention who say, not only is stone eight hypothesis ridiculous, but they're using niacin opposite psilocybin in clinical studies. And if you saw no activity with psilocin with, BDA, with track B, why would you dilute it more? You naturally would increase it. There's no stimulation of track B with psilocin. But in combination with lion's mane, and niacin, there is. So we started looking at psilocybin analogs. We have norcilocin and niacin. Again, with track A's, maximum calculable value, synergism. We looked at norbeocystin and niacin. Some signal with norbeocystin, no signal with niacin, predicted additive sum, stacking, and synergy. We have 50 of these maximum calculable value tests. This is just not two or three charts. Obviously, I can't show you 50 of them. I think I have found something that is paradigm shifting, that is huge. And these analogs are present inside of the psilocybin mushrooms. 
So we have all the experts teaching away from this invention. It is hiding in plain sight. It takes somebody like me, an outlier, to come into neuro ne neurological medicine to just take a different view. I think this is the history of innovation and science in general. <clears throat> okay, so I have less than five minutes. It also, we found, stimulates interleukin 10s. These are anti inflammatories. To have neurogeneration coupled with a neuro anti inflammatory, for physicians in the audience, this is very significant. New cell growth is oftentimes associated with a pro inflammatory response. The fact that this stack also excites interleukin 10s is yet another added benefit. So the stack stimulates neurogenesis and neuroplasticity in the central peripheral nervous system. All of this needs to be validated with controlled clinical studies. But we have now evidence empirically from the TAP test. We also have it from the MAPK data that you've seen. And I want to propose to you we are no longer the homo sapiens of the past 200,000 years. It is time for us to evolve into a new species. I'm proposing that this new Latin binomial be Homo ascendus. <laughs> we are at a crossroads, folks. We are in the most dire of times. 99% of the species in the fossil record are species that have become extinct. Extinction is a natural course of evolution. We are now facing, I believe, an extinction-based event. We have uncontrolled climate, climate chaos. We have zoonotic disease vectors. We have bird flu. We have COVID. We have monkeypox. We have viral storms now, common, coming at us at all angles. As we lose biodiversity, as we increasingly pollute the environment, as we lose food biosecurity, as diseases spread, as wars proliferate, we are at a time we need to reinvent the human species. I think psilocybin makes nicer people. Psilocybin reduces violence. Psilocybin can help us overcome addiction. Psilocybin can make us better people. Psilocybin can help us respect and honor biodiversity, indigenous wisdom, medical science. We are at time critical. I think the stack will increase intelligence for us to create the inventions that are so needed for us to invent new solutions that can help us overcome this impending calamity. The bases are loaded, folks, and nature bats last. This is our time. All of you can help champion a course change in the evolution of a human species. It is up to us to do this, and we can do this. I think psilocybin is one way for that success. Thank you very much. I'm going to take a couple questions or so if you still. Okay, okay great. <clears throat> Hi. Yeah. Thank you very, very much for the lecture. And I'm very interested in the mechanism of action of microdosing, and it is a paradigm shifting uh, topic. And I, I would like to, to hear you about your view, because those are post receptor pathways. So how do you envision that works? I mean, we've been thought of good dose, overdose, suboptimal dose. Now we're talking about microdose. So what do you think happens in the receptor to actually trigger those post-receptor pathways? Well, I, your question is excellent, and I'm not sure if we have the knowledge base to be able to answer that right now. 
that's a testable you know, question. The thing I also want just to mention, just to keep this in focus on a tap test, consider the, the confounders. The p-value was 0 0.004. You have variability in the potency of the psilocybin that's been taken, variability in the amount of psilocybin mushrooms that have been taken, variability in the niacin that people are taking, variability in the, in the lion's mane that's taking. Those three confounders would dilute significance, not increase it. So when you ask about the postsynaptic pathways, these are great academic questions. But the reality is, how can you explain this? If a person is no longer depressed taking psychedelics, isn't that the goal of the physician and the therapist is to help the patient? Or do we get mired in academic questions of mode of action not be able to fully to explain the significance of the results that we see. So this is where the problem of science, you know, butts up against reality. If you see an actual benefit with people neurologically, retroactively we can figure out the mechanisms of action. The real world benefit is now in here and ready to deploy. So I love questions like this. I was not speaking your data. <laughs> But I, so I, these are great questions. So I, I think what we have, from my point of view, is a diffusion gradient, where the entourage effect is activating at all of these concentrations. And they may be buffered, some concentrations better for track A, track B, uh, jack one. So you're activating in the entourage effect all these different proteins that, that bind with these receptors in the course of your microdosing. So, very popular practice now, high doses in Canada, high doses of psilocybin, therapeutically with a therapist, chased by microdosing. Well, the idea is once you have this epiphany experience, a new way of thinking, by microdosing you then can revisit those neurological pathways that can be more prominently resident for you to do it in the future. So I think bundling of these two is really important. Um, and this is something, since there may be government people watching this, do you really want to have people go into a therapeutic center in a hospital or a, you know, a, psychiatric, a psychiatrist's office for six hours when you're taking one thousandth of a dose of psilocybin? You'd be bored out of your gourd. <laughs> and plus, there is no detrimental effect in terms of coordination, driving. In fact, you might be better. So this is where we need to make sure that the legal system does not prohibit by its structure microdosing when it can have such a dramatically positive benefit. So I would literally like to see, and Oregon made a huge mistake with Measure 109. They, they basically made microdosing, if you do a microdose of any detectable amount of psilocybin, you have to go into a therapeutic center and sit there for six hours. Can you believe it? It's like going to a doctor's office to take your vitamins, right? <laughs> and this is positioned to be a nootropic vitamin. So we are looking forward to um, clinical studies, which we're currently designing um, at multiple medical institutions. And um, June 1st is a very big day. That is our coming out. Dennis, you kind of busted us by mentioning the, the new company that we formed. <laughs> So June 1st is our coming out of our, of our, our new company, um, and folks will be hearing about that. So I, I, it's a long answer to a great question, but I, I, think, I, I think I answered your question. Yes, thank you. All right, we got a question back here. Hi, Paul. Um, I think you raised a really good point um, around paradigm shift in, in multiple areas, but one that I, sort of stuck out at me was um, scientific, uh, reduction of scientific inquiry using just, you know, psilocybin, uh, chemically made psilocybin. How do you think we actually change that paradigm upon which um, people, people are conducting it on the stemic stack or, or non, the, not the current niacine paradigm that we, we were, we're in? Uh, great question. Well, Roland Griffiths and I are uh, thankfully good friends. And uh, we, he came to me in 1997 for psilocybin mushrooms. Um, I explained all, all the issues, and only if the DEA gave me permission could I do that. The DEA has approved me. 
uh, for uh, psilocybin mushroom cultivation the state of Washington has not. Um, so we're waiting for that approval and we'll be supplying Johns Hopkins for a side-by-side -side psilocybin mushrooms to pure molecule psilocybin. Empirically, a medical doctor who's conducted some research has in interviewing patients have found that the pure molecule tends to be like this in the experience. It's more of a block. Whereas the psilocybin tends to be a ramp up with a long tail. And the patients are reporting that long tail after effect, they believe has much greater benefit for processing. And is much friendlier than this rocket ship. You know, from a very high amount. And you can imagine psilocybin very quickly metabolized. The mushrooms have got to be digested. So that's, that's something we're looking forward to. So in the clinical study at Johns Hopkins, they've written a proposal to us. We've accepted it. We're in negotiation discussions. Once we can legally grow psilocybin mushrooms and provide them, then our first baseline study is psilocybin, pure molecule versus psilocybin. The mushrooms standardized that same molecule. And then defining the metrics of measurement. So any physicians here want to weigh in. Uh, Dr. Pram Crisco is, is uh, our, our lead here. And so please, she's a medical doctor and the head of the Canadian Psychedelic Association. So please you know, talk to her, or talk to me, or talk to us both. You know, what type of metrics of measurement that would be best for, we, for us to look at um, in this upcoming clinical study. We have two other clinical studies planned, also using the, the stack versus not the stack. So I'll take one more question. Yeah, thank you, Paul. That was brilliant. I mean, as a guy that, that believes in everything that you do in terms of all this mixture, that was just spoken right to my heart. Uh, I wanted to ask something uh, a little bit a little more morose on the side of death. Uh, and this is because uh, what really struck to me is when you had brought up some of these charts here showing uh, neuroregeneration, uh, and you had mentioned the term senescence, and I'm perhaps a little bit biased from the environment I come from, that so many people are using that towards, how can we use this to live longer? Um, and I'm very conscious here with an aunt who is rapidly uh, de declining from dementia that you know her last days we were focused more on not how do we prolong her life but how do we make the quality better uh, I would love to hear your thoughts here around uh, you know what what the plants have taught us as I think back to fantastic fungi of uh, you know, mushrooms and fungi teaching us around processing of death uh, around you know prolong how we can use these tools here to either prolong life versus having a higher quality of life and what is it we can learn and what should we be taking away from uh, these lessons well, the, many studies have, have come out showing that people are, have less anxiety about their own mortality. They feel they're in the context of the molecular flow of the universe. They're part of one giant consciousness that's been really well documented. But the area, since I'm very also involved in immunology, what I'm really interested in, I looked up New England Journal of Medicine, et cetera, when people are emotionally depressed, they're immunologically depressed. So when they're happier, they're more creative, and their immune system is at a higher ready state. So think of that. When you're depressed, you don't want to work on a book, you don't want to do your artwork, you are you know, morose. Well, your immune system is downregulated. And the opposite is the case. So how many of those people's lives will be extended from increasing their, their attitude and aptitude immunologically and so that's, that's a subject matter that's been very well discussed in medicine, is depression leads to disease, physiological disease, and emotional happiness leads to a better immune state of readiness. So I think psilocybin microdosing could eventually be proven to extend life. So thank you very much, folks.